Good evening everyone. Welcome to the budget webinar. My name is Valley Morford. I'm the coordinator of place management here at the city of Charles Sturt and I will be your webinar facilitator tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the very first time Charles Sturt has used webinar technology for a consultation. So we're very practiced at running face-to-face -face events. We're very practiced at running workshops and town hall meetings, but this is quite different for us. So we request that you please show a little patience and bear with us if we have a few teething problems. So we have a jam-packed agenda for you tonight. We have Mayor Angela Evans in the wings waiting who will be making a presentation for you all. We have some live polls to do with the audience. We have, well most importantly, we'll be providing you, the audience, with the opportunity to ask our panel questions, which is what we're all here for. So thank you for attending tonight. Okay, so far we have 13 people in attendance. Now when you all registered for this webinar, we actually took the suburb of your residence. So I'm just going to give you a little indication of where everyone's from. So we have a number of people from Woodville here with us today. We have Henley Beach South represented, Fulham Gardens, Semaphore Park, West Lakes, Seaton, Grange, Bowden, Beverly, Flinders Park and West Lake Shore. So, um, we've got people from all over the city here tonight. It's really fantastic to see. So thank you for tuning in. Okay, so before we kick off with our presentations, I thought I'd do a little more polling with you all and find out who else is in the room, so to speak. So here we go. I have some live polls ready to go. Now the very first one, have you ever participated in a webinar before? Here we go, the results are coming in. Okay, still building, still building. Great, it looks like everyone has completed this. Right, I'm going to share the results with you now. So the majority of you haven't participated in a webinar before, which is great to hear because <laughs> we haven't run one before. Um, but many of you have, about 40%, 42% have participated in before. Right, time for our next poll. Excellent. We'd like to hear what age bracket you're from so we can have a bit of an understanding of you know, the diversity of the demographic that is participating with us today. Okay, the results are coming in. Okay, here we go. Give it just a few more moments. Excellent. Right, ready to share the results with you. So there we go. 70% are in the 18 to 34 bracket. 75 are in the 35 to 54 and just 8%, 55 to 70 and no one is above the 70s. Interesting. Alrighty, one more, just one more poll. So are you a ratepayer of the city of Charles Sturt? A little more moment, just waiting. Okay, right, time to share the results with you. So, 58% are ratepayers, but 42% are ratepayers, aren't ratepayers. Very interesting. Thank you very much for participating in that. Great. So now it's time for me to introduce our panel. So we'll just wait a moment. Okay. Bear with me a moment. I'm just going to get the panelists up on the screen. Here we go. So welcome panelists. Thank you for being here tonight. Our first panelist I'd like to introduce you all to is Mayor Angela Evans. Hi Angela. 
Our second one is Darren Burbeck. Now, Darren's the General Manager of Corporate Services. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so both Angela and Darren will be making presentations, just short presentations for you all tonight. Okay, we have two more members of the panel. We have Jan Cornish, who's the General Manager of Asset Services. Hi, Valley. Hi, everyone. Uh, and we also have Bruce Williams, the General Manager of City Services. Good evening, Valley. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. So all of our panellists, so all four, will be participating in the Q&A session, which we have coming up soon. Okay, so how do you ask questions? You might be wondering that. Well, you can ask questions via the question tool, which is part of your webinar toolbox. So if you have a look at your toolbox and find the question tool, but you can also ask questions via social media using the hashtag budget webinar. So that's one word, it's hashtag budget, me budget webinar, and please make sure that your social media posts are set to public so we can receive them. Great. Um, when you're questioning, a few tips. It would be excellent if you can make your question short and to the point. We'll do our best to get through them, or get through as many of them as we can. Um, and also a little bit more about this software. You, the viewer, are in control of what you see tonight. So you can select the windows and you can resize them as you would like, using your mouse, of course. All right. So I'm going to ask Mayor Angela Evans to speak first. Are you ready, Angela? I am. Thanks, Valley. Good evening, Great. everyone. Thank you for joining us for Charles Sturt's first ever budget consultation webinar. We're really excited to be able to consult on our draft annual business plan and budget and to be able to do so in such a new way. We had around 115,000 residents in the city of Charles Sturt and we recognised the unique diversity in our communities as well as joined together with our residents to celebrate our common connections. Each year when we consult on our draft annual business plan and budget, our role as an elected member body is to re represent all of our residents to the best of our ability and to build a direction for the next financial year. This direction must be one of investing in our community, maintaining the integrity of our many council assets and adhering to the responsible long-term financial uh, plan. We also have considerable assets to maintain and rather than this being a burden, I feel excited about the way we can invest to ensure we protect our assets into the future. Some of the major assets we look to focus on in, two, in 2016 uh, to 2017 include the Footpath Renewal Program called Pathways to Prosperity. We want to dedicate further funding to increase our current footpath and curb and gutter renewal program. We have a successful and robust footpath replacement and renewal program and this further funding will contribute an additional $1.7 million to the footpath program's existing $4.9 million for a total of $6.6 .6 million in 2016-17. This increase in funding will address the current um, backlog of customer requests relating to files and curbs and gutters needing repair and will ensure our program is not delayed into the future. The second focus is our reserves. In previous years, we have successfully upgraded a number of reserves, bringing modern facilities, playground and exercise equipment and natural elements together to reflect our city's love of the outdoors. For 2016 to 2017, our reserves to be upgraded will include sites at Port Malcolm, Albert Green Shields, Ordsman's, and Maramba Reserves and planning for an upgrade of the MJ McInerney Reserve in future years with a budget of $1.9 million. The last project I'd like to highlight is the Port Road Flood Mitigation Works. This carries on from our successful and award-winning Waterproof in the West project and our initial works last year to mitigate flooding along Port Road. In 2016 to 2017, we aim to commit $2 million to further this project. Thank you to all of you who are participating tonight in our webinar and also to those ratepayers who are joining the consultation process for the budget. I'd now like to hand over to Darren Burbeck, General Manager of Corporate Services. Thank you, Mary Evans. I'm looking forward to interacting with you all tonight on the draft annual business plan and budget for 2016-17. 
I'm going to spend a minute taking you through some of the key points that we consider when drafting our budget for consultation. And once I'm finished, we'll open up with the webinar and take questions and answer you in real time. So moving on to the slide. Um, at, the, at the City of Charles Sturt, our budgets are prepared progressively over several months and commences with a review of our asset management plans and the preparation of a long-term financial plan. The long-term financial planning we use tools to examine the potential impact of our decisions over the long term in determining what the community can afford for a level of rates, debt and services. The resultant long-term financial plan is used to ensure financial sustainability over the long term while maintaining our significant infrastructure worth over $1 billion. An important aspect of the long-term financial plan is that every generation pays for the benefits that they receive, both in terms of services and asset renewal. We measure this through the operating surplus ratio, which we maintain with a target range of between 0 and 15%. The long-term financial plan enables us to ensure that long-term liabilities are fully funded and that there is adequate renewal and maintenance of infrastructure. Our high level parameters. Um, based on our forecast modelling for 2016-17, we're proposing a rate increase of 4.9% plus growth for new properties in the city. This increase can be explained by a projected 3.2% increase plus an additional 1.7% for the footpath, curb and gut renewal program outlined by the Mayor for a total increase of 4.9%. This increase for the average residential ratepayer will be about $63.25 per year. Rates are a form of broad-based property taxation. The funds collected are used to deliver services in the local community and extend from the traditional areas of roads and rubbish collection to various community services and economic development initiatives. This year, we're proposing a budget which includes capital expenditure of $26.7 million on renewal assets and $10.1 million for new and upgrade projects for a total of $36.8 million. To fund this spending, our net borrowings will be $9.2 million. Our operating surplus for the recurrent budget is forecast to be $3.9 million. We have included annual operating projects of $2.2 million, resulting in an operating surplus of $1.7 million. We aim to achieve an operating surplus ratio of between 0 and 15% to ensure that our current ratepayers are paying for their current consumption of resources. Any surplus is used to fund future expenditure for the benefit of the local community. Thank you, and I'll just pass now back to Valley. Okay, give me a moment. The webcam's... There we go. Sorry about that. The webcam's a little slow to open up. Great. Thank you very much for your presentations, panel. We're about to start with our live Q&A session. Now I can see that there are some questions coming through. Just another very quick reminder, to ask a question, use the question tool in the webinar toolbox. You can also ask questions via social media using the hashtag budgetwebinar. That's budgetwebinar, just one word. We will do our best to get through all of the questions tonight, as many as we can within the limited time that we have. Um, but I would just like to remind you that this is a live experience. We have a team of people behind the scenes who are forwarding questions directly to our panel. So, panel, are you ready to take your first question? Yes, we are. Yes. yes. Who would like to go first? Well, uh, there, uh, Kay from Grange via Facebook has asked me, why is there such a big increase in our area when other councils are not increasing their rates? Thanks very much, Kay, for your question. This is uh, one that I often get around about this time of year. Uh, as we've already said, this increase in 2016-17 proposed for the average residential rate pay will be about $63.25 um, per year. And it's, it's, the question itself is actually quite a difficult one to answer uh, because it requires us to compare apples with apples. Um, and you know, as a council, we are distinctly different than all other councils around about us. The, the, um, the uh, expectations of our community in some ways are quite unique. And so that has an influence on um, the sorts of uh, aspirations that we as a council have, and that's reflected 
often in um, the decisions and the variations that you get in, in the uh, amount of a, of a rate increase that you see across the um, when it's compared with other councils. So um, I can't give you a particular answer as to why ours is is uh, um, look at appearing more um, uh, um, larger than everyone else, other than the fact that we've got some very large projects that we're contemplating this year. Whether or not other councils are contemplating that sort of um, uh, asset um, renewal, I, I don't know. That's probably something for you to inquire further about. Thanks very much. On to the next question. Um, I've got a question here from Bren, uh, Brendan from Highmarsh uh, via webinar. Uh, why is Coast Park so expensive? Uh, surely there are more things to spend money on. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware of the Coast Park project, uh, Coast Park is a state government initiative to develop a park, a continuous park, including a shared use park from Selix Beach to in the south of uh, the metropolitan coast uh, to North Haven in the north, which is approximately 70 kilometres. Um, Charles Sturt has approximately 11 and a half kilometres of coast mm -hmm. and uh, to date we've constructed approximately 7 kilometres of the coast park uh, path, uh, including a shared use path. Um, the remaining section is about 4.8 kilometres long and we estimate uh, with some preliminary concept planning work that we have done that it will cost in the order of 8 to $9 million to construct um, a shared path, depending on the path alignment option that council chooses. Um, but we anticipate receiving 50% of the cost of the project from state government, uh, and our share of that um, will be uh, $4 million, which we're anticipating will be undertaken, works undertaken over a two year period. So we've uh, made provision in the budget for 16 17 financial year for uh, $2 million to commence that project. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the next question has come up um, from Sarah in High Marsh via the webinar. Um, how much money do you pay for your workers? You need to think about whether we are getting our bang for our buck. Now, our wages are based on the current base establishment of full time equivalent staff. Um, we have just over 488 full time equivalents, um, which include, include 16 full time equivalents which are grant funded. Uh, any changes to that base establishment must be put up as a business case and we're very strict on that, and a budget bid must go through to a, a, the annual budget, budget process. Um, wages are negotiated through an enterprise bargaining um, process, like many other organisations. We pay to an award structure, and salaries are based on an assessment of skills required for the role undertaken. Well, we can only cut wages to reduce size of the increase if it was negotiated through an EB. I hope that answers your question, Sarah. The next question comes from Craig uh, from Highmarsh via webinar and Craig has asked uh, regarding uh, a project bid that's been submitted in our budget for the public art stage 2 of $30,000. Has anyone seen the proposed main art piece as $100,000 has already been spent on stage 1? I have significant concerns regarding this additional $30,000 and recommend it be withdrawn from the draft budget. Uh, thanks Craig, look it's fair to say at this stage that this is a, uh, a bid, uh, so it's not yet been approved by council. Um, it's fair to say that stage one uh, has already been undertaken as you've noted. Uh, stage two was the subject of a public uh, community art panel, so we did uh, have members of our local community who all um, contributed to identifying their favoured um, design uh, that, uh, to receive the funding. Uh, it's fair to say that art, um, public art often uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and it, it often attracts critical acclaim. Um, so yeah, it will be interesting to see whether it gets uh, council approval, but of course, as you're aware, um, the whole project um, for the public art is to be funded jointly between Renewal SA um, and, and Council. Um, so it is a, a partnership piece and it's uh, contributing to enjoying everybody in the public realm. So um, yeah, uh, we look forward to seeing 
uh, whether it does ultimately get funding. And just on that, Bruce, there is, it is a public consultation and if people want to support uh, a particular bid or feel that the bid shouldn't be in uh, the next budget, then they can go and participate in the consultation and reflect those views very um, clearly to us. Mm. Question five um, from Bruce from Finland via the webinar. Why are you spending dollars on going to China when you know residents are struggling here? Uh, thanks for the question, Bruce. In 2015-16, uh, uh, businesses paid $26.2 million in rates on average. Um, they pay about $7,000 a year in rates. And we're committed uh, to generating more opportunities for our city and our businesses to grow and develop and become viable long-term prospects. The $22,000 that was spent this year and the $30,000 for the next year is not just for the mayor to fly to China. It's, a, it's dedicated for a number of staff to explore further opportunities to grow our city's businesses. Uh, $19,635 um, for the 2016 China mission trip um, was distributed in, in the following way. Uh, $10,300 went towards promotional material. Um, my cost for travel and accommodation was $3,100 um, and, and it was a similar amount for the CEO staff person including um, $700 for a travel card to spend of which I spent $100 for the eight days that we were away. Finally, um, $30,000, um, uh, um, there was a $30,000 allocation, $10,000 of which for business mission in the upcoming year. Um, the costs uh, once again for myself will be a third um, and $10,000 on promotional material and $10,000 for incoming mission when we receive Chinese um, dignitaries and uh, you know the purpose of this is really understanding the Chinese culture and the importance of government to government relationships and the significance of mayors speaking to mayors in order to open up the communication pathways that will ultimately have a direct business, uh, sorry, a direct benefit back to businesses um, that we expect will have been an outcome um, in terms of uh, the economic prosperity of our city and, in fact, the whole state. I, sh I should add, uh, Mayor, that um, we understand the value of the latest trade mission is that uh, some of the businesses from within Charleston who participate in that trade mission are close to signing uh, contracts yes. with uh, Chinese companies, which is great for the export of um, products from base, uh, companies based in Charles Sturt. Um, and also importantly, uh, we um, had an aged care consortium of about 13 businesses from within Charles Sturt uh, who um, went to China to actually mm -hmm. promote the advantages uh, and the, the range of services that we can provide. Um, given the advanced uh, nature of the Chinese middle class, um, aged care is a real a pressing issue for them and that was received extremely favourably. We believe that the Aged Care Consortium will be uh, coming back with a, a range of potential um, contracts that are going to be really good for them um, but greater, uh, more greatly for economic development within our city uh, yeah. and jobs and future investments. So they are the sorts of feedback that we are getting back as a result of the trade mission was undertaken. Yes, very encouraging. Okay. Could I just pause you for a moment, panel? We're having a small issue with one of our polls not closing down. So just give me a second. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. You can resume with your Q&A. Well, the next question is from Kimberly um, via the webinar once again. Um, what services do councils provide? Um, what do state government do in contrast? Now, as someone relatively new to the sector, um, it's a very valid question. Um, more than rates, rates and rubbish, that's for sure. That's right. um, uh, every dollar we collect goes into providing services for the, the community and maintaining our infrastructure. Five libraries, community centres, economic development, asset management, community building and place making and environmental initiatives. We attempt to strike a balance between the service and infrastructure we're responsible for and the rates we collect at to provide those services while we're ensuring a financially sustainable into the long term. Some of the things we have to pay for include road materials, wages, waste and utilities 
and all of the increases are far greater than CPI. Unfortunately, costs continue to rise. So maintaining in excess of $1 billion in community infrastructure like roads, footpaths and stormwater to an acceptable standard. We have to work out the life of the asset and work through an asset management plan. Because the community wants it to be a broad range of services with an increasing quality of service. Um, as I said before, the, the raises, the increases in costs in water, electricity um, and all the other factors are, are significant impacts for us. We have a question here from Kate via the webinar. How do you feel the council is going with respect to obtaining 20% canopy cover by 2020, which is one of your goals? Um, what are you actively doing to achieve this, given the budget uh, doesn't seem to show a genuine increase in budget in this area? Um, Thanks very much for the question. Uh, there's a lot of work that we are doing in uh, the area of uh, tree planting. Um, the loss of trees is uh, of some concern to Council because as um, more urban development occurs we are finding that even backyard trees are reducing in numbers. Um, but um, we have a number of uh, projects, the Mayor um, talked about some of them at Point Malcolm Reserve and various other reserves uh, next year where um, not only upgrading of uh, footpaths and uh, playgrounds and those sorts of uh, harder infrastructure assets uh, but those projects will also see an increase in the number of uh, trees that are planted uh, to compensate for some of the canopy loss. Um, we also have some programs uh, including uh, Planet Arc Day where we partner with schools uh, to plant uh, trees in our public reserves. Um, we also um, have a Trees for the Future program um, which is really planting some of those uh, larger trees that we're seeing lost to the urban environment uh, and planting them in the, the reserves where uh, they will have a, a longer life and be able to uh, grow to their glory. Uh, we have another question here from Anne via uh, webinar. Um, she says, I don't use the library and ask, can I have a discount on my rates? <laughs> oh, we do get people asking about this one. Uh, the rates are a tax, uh, not a fee for service, and the money collected is used to fund all the services and infrastructure for the city and laid down in a budget. And I'd encourage you to get out into our community and get excited about what we do offer, right along the linear park, visit our beaches, they're glorious our libraries, meet new people and learn to dance at our community centres. We have so much on offer. Thanks, Em. I should add too, Meg, that we have recently changed the opening hours of our libraries to make them more accessible, particularly over weekends, which is when so many people want to access them. It is worthwhile popping into the library, uh, because it's a great way to meet other people uh, within your community yeah. and uh, access information, um, yeah. and let alone borrow the book. So uh, it, is, it is actually a really healthy pastime, so I encourage you to do it. We have a lot of really great low cost and no cost activities during school holidays for kids yes. and I like school holidays now. Yeah. So if you um, have got children at home and you're wondering what to do, please go to the City of Charles Sturt website where you can get that information. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Bob in Semaphore um, and he asks, property values keep rising each year, what do you do with the extra money that you collect? Well in fact, Councils don't receive a windfall revenue from rising property values. Each year, um, a council will decide on how much it requires from rates, income to deliver the infrastructure requirements and service levels. This amount is then determined after taking into account the impact of loans and other forces such as grants and plan planning and application fees, and then the rates are set. So in fact, there's a rate and a dollar calculation that's performed to um, that doesn't simply go up with property rates. That's a, a, common, um, a common myth. We have a question here from uh, Ash from Grange via Twitter and the question is when will you upgrade the St Clair Recreation Centre? Um, for those of you who have lived in Charles Sturt for uh, some time you'll know that Ch uh, the St Clair Indoor Recreation Centre is uh, our only council uh, owned and managed facility um, that provides indoor recreation for um, the West 
the Western region, it's a very significant uh, facility and it is ageing, it was built in the 60s. Um, we have uh, made provision within our long-term financial plan for a significant upgrade of the centre uh, and uh, at, the moment, at present the uh, plans are that we would be uh, aiming to undertake work in starting in July, August of 2017-18. Uh, uh, we have $9.7 million provisioned um, for the actual inter, uh, indoor recreation centre itself and uh, an additional um, amount of money uh, for upgrading the recreational area surrounding that. Um, we've undertaken work recently to make the facility safe. We did have some problems with the ceiling um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's been made safe and we're currently in discussions with the uh, state and federal government uh, in terms of uh, identifying opportunities for funding from them uh, to assist in um, basically rebuilding um, the St Clair Indoor Recreation Centre and making it the vibrant place that it uh, was once uh, in the 60s. Mm. Excellent. Mm. There's also a subsequent question um, that has been asked here, which is uh, where did the previously allocated one to two million dollars for St Clair Recreation Centre go? Um, as I mentioned before, we did have some problems with um, the roof. Uh, it's leaking, it's, it's old and it was leaking. Um, Council had provisioned two million dollars to undertake work to um, replace the roof. Um, $2 million is a big spend um, when you consider that the uh, facility itself doesn't really um, satisfy uh, the sporting code requirements um, of today. It was fine in the 60s, but it's not satisfying those sporting requirements today. When we started to look at the detail of the replacement of the roof, what we found is that um, to undertake the roof work and meet current codes, we had to increase the roof height by about a metre or just over. And if we were to do that, it meant that it was going to uh, introduce a number of other um, things that we would have to be compliant with. So things like the Building Code of Australia and also um, the Disability Discrimination Act uh, requirements. And that was then starting to push the uh, cost of the uh, roof replacement up to about four, $4 million. Mm -hmm. um, and as a consequence, Council decided to do that. Um, remedial work, I think it was about $200,000 that we spent on doing that work um, and put us in a better position to actually identify what we needed for um, the facility for the longer term. The next question is um, from Mike in Beverly by the webinar. What's happening with flooding on Woodville and Port Roads? I hope you're dealing with it. As part of the um, Waterproofing the West project in 2014, uh, Council upgraded stormwater drains between Old Point Road, Newport Road and Frederick Road and this was part of a larger aquifer storage and recharge project which will see uh, 2.4 gigalitres of stormwater being captured and injected into the aquifer. <coughs> Stage 1 of the Port Road drainage project undertaken in the current buying year, natural year has involved detailed design and consultation related to an extension of the drain from the old Port Road, New Port Road intersection to Park Street South. It's, uh, it is estimated to cost in the order of $22 million and will be staged over three financial years subject to finalising negotiations with stormwater management authority in relation to the scope of the work and funding. Uh, so we're looking quite expectantly to uh, the happening and alleviating those sorts of problems. Um, we have a question here from uh, Robert via webinar. Uh, how much do we spend on our beaches? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a figure off uh, the top of my head, Robert, but um, the beaches are actually the responsibility of the state government for uh, their upkeep and care. Um, however, Council does have some programs that it um, runs, uh, and there is one figure that I'm aware of, and that is um, each year we spend about $20,000, I think it is this year. In the past, it has been about $25,000 a year on uh, replacing uh, sand roof fencing along the beach at key locations, and that's to establish a, a, a deeper dune at some locations. 
Uh, we also are responsible for maintaining the east-west access ways uh, to, the, to the beach so that enable people to get down into the beach. Um, and uh, each year for the last few years and projected into the next uh, four or five years, uh, we anticipate spending about $140,000 per year upgrading uh, those east-west beach access ways. Um, we also have um, the Coast Park uh, path that we're responsible for maintaining, so we uh, run a street sweeper along um, the path on a regular program basis. And in addition to that, we have a biodiversity team of two people who uh, operate along uh, both the coast and along the River Torrance Linear Park and work on uh, removal of weeds and establishing biodiversity areas. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the figures for those uh, additional items of biodiversity. As well. I think at this point, Valley's going to do a poll. Um, are you there, Valley? Hi, now I am. <laughs> okay. Apologies for the poll malfunction before. Okay, we're going to try a few more. Bear with me. Here we go. Okay. Very interested in hearing from the audience on this one. Have you submitted feedback already on the draft annual business plan? No. Oh, yes, it's creeping up. Yes, it's creeping up. Okay, I'll just give it another moment. All right, I'm going to close this poll. I'm going to share the results. So it's looking like 88% haven't completed or haven't provided feedback yet, but 13% have. Excellent. Right, let's try another one. Okay, this is a juicy question for you all. So we'd like you to rate your level of support for council. For, well, for, uh, just a bit tongue-tied. Please rate your level of support for council funding a footpath renewal project to increase local employment in our city. Okay, polls are coming in. Okay, I'll just give it a little more moment, a little moment more. All right, closing it down. Now I'm going to share the results with you all. There we go. Interesting result, actually. Um, the majority of people, 42%, are very unsupportive, 33 unsupportive. Um, but there is a small amount of support there, with 17 supportive and 8% very supportive. So. That's a very interesting result. Okay, we have one more poll for you. So we're asking you to please rate your level of satisfaction with the draft annual business plan. Okay. All right, here we go. That one. And here we go, I'm going to share it with you all. Okay, that's an interesting result too. No one's very satisfied and no one's very unsatisfied. So the majority of the um, thoughts are in the middle region, but the dominant answer there is that 54% are satisfied with the draft annual business plan. Interesting. Okay. We've got a bit more time to take more questions. So a few more questions. Are you ready, panel, to take a couple more? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have one from Chris by the webinar. Will rates rise every year now that they're so high? And why did you get rid of that budget group? So, Darren, why don't you take <laughs> it away? <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't necessarily rise every year, um, just because there is an increase this year. Um, we review the long-term financial plan each year to determine the rates required, and I think we've mentioned that a few times yeah. um, today. Um, and in terms of that budget group, um, we're trying new ways every year to um, engage with, with everybody. We want to get people engaged with the budget process. 
We really would like to hear your feedback. And um, this year we're trying a new way in, in the webinar. Yeah. So, uh, and we're yeah. really pleased that you've um, you know, come on board. Yeah. And I agree with Darren. I mean, look, that we're really um, energetic about um, connecting with our community in ways that. Um, you know, give us a benefit, but also give them a sense of belonging. We know that community consultation is one of those ways. Um, but community is evolving and changing all the time, and we need to move along with that as well. So, uh, you know, one of the, one of the um, I think, uh, uh, really challenging but also very um, fun parts about um, uh, council and what we do is that we get to we get to use different methods of consultation, and in that test. We're right at the moment. Um, what's going to fit the best for our community? So Darren's right. This webinar is is one of those tests. I don't know if we'll use it next year. Maybe not. But for now, it's uh, you know the gateway. These sorts of technologies are the gateway into the, the, the means in which we communicate into the future. And we have to start sometimes. But we've also got other ways of um, consulting with our community. And as has already been said, if you want to give us feedback around uh, our um, particular budget at the moment, there are other means where you can uh, make your thoughts known or alternatively if you know anyone else that's interested in having some input, please don't hesitate to let them know that uh, currently at the moment we're still in our consultation process and there are a few different ways in which you can participate. Okay, well, we now have um, a question from Awesome Dude, <laughs> uh, and yes that is his real name, or their real name, um, and uh, Awesome Dude has asked uh, an awesome question. How do you determine <laughs> what projects are budgeted for? And um, just for information, uh, as a, uh, a council organisation, we have a long term financial plan that essentially sets a forecast of uh, expenditure required to um, maintain our, our services, uh, but also maintain all of our assets and infrastructure. And I think we've got a billion dollars worth of. Uh, assets on our books that need to be maintained, and we're also a service organisation. So that long-term financial plan uh, forecasts our expenditure for about 10 years, uh, and then every year there's a range of uh, initiatives uh, or budget uh, bids that are generated, um, both from uh, staff but also from elected members, uh, and they're scored or rated in accordance with the alignment of those projects with. Uh, our community plan, which is our main uh, strategic plan for uh, our council and also our community. Uh, so based on the amount of points uh, or scores that each of those projects gets uh, or is allocated, determines uh, its priority uh, and therefore whether it is actually funded for the ensuing uh, financial year. So um, thanks for that awesome question and I hope that was a, an awesome answer. <laughs> Jane, yeah, so we have a question here, um, which is, can you explain what the Pathways to Prosperity project is, and why is uh, it hiking up the cost of the budget? And um, also, the question is, are we making cocktails <laughs> with these uh, lemons and limes? They're actually, not, they're actually mandarins and limes. Um, so the Pathways to Prosperity program is um, a program that's looking at um, reducing what we call a backlog of uh, customer requests for uh, footpath maintenance work and also curb and gutter works. Um, and the intent is to escalate that uh, program and reduce the backlog and in the process um, employ um, people to do that. So uh, we've estimated that uh, an additional $1.7 million in the 2016-17 financial year uh, would assist us in uh, addressing the backlog and potentially employ in the order of about uh, 12 uh, people and be able to upskill them in a trade. Um, the, you might then ask the question, well, why do we actually have a backlog? Um, we have uh, 1,300 kilometres of footpath uh, within the city. Uh, we have an asset management plan for our paths. Um, we are undertaking $4.9 million worth of renewal work next year. Mm -hmm. uh, but the backlog program relates to those uh, requests that we might get from the public to fix and repair a trip step that is uh, uh, in line with, let's say, a uh, tree root. Um, sometimes as the moisture content of the soil changes, um, 
uh, the soil expands and contracts and can create cracks. Um, we have a program where we go out and respond to those inquiries. We uh, make good and make safe the issue, and that might be by way of grinding, it might be by way of painting uh, a yellow line to like the fact that there is a trip step there. Um, and then if we can't address the um, problem to our satisfaction, then it might be that we need to remove a couple of slabs under a tree and um, it's, it's, that, it's that component uh, that actually goes on a program. And we've got about uh, two years worth of backlog um, of, that, the, of that sort of work. Um, and the intent is to try to address that, to those issues and make our uh, paths much safer for our community. Thanks, Jan. Uh, just to um, run this into a question from Robert. Uh, he asked the Liberal Party has introduced rate capping. How will this affect our future rates? Um, this is a, a, a proposal that's recent, uh, has just recently been put forward. And um, the great concern that it has for uh, me is that it assumes a great deal about how councils um, can actually uh, go about doing their business and delivering um, the services that they do to their communities. Um, it assumes, of course, that um, we can continue to, to deliver the same level of service to our community um, and at a, at a greatly reduced pr um, cost uh, than what we're currently experiencing. And that if we want to uh, do more than what, we, what, what the rate capping will allow us to do, then we'll have to go to an independent third party to make that decision for us. Um, that has some huge implications. Um, quite simply, residents um, will not be able to see the, um, I guess, the responsiveness that this council has always had to its needs and um, things like community centres, uh, our libraries, um, some of the infrastructure projects that we do uh, will all be questioned now. Um, sporting clubs, for example, uh, we have, as I said, 115,000 people in our city of Charles Sturt, one in six people that's connected to sporting clubs, either directly playing sport or as volunteers. And uh, they need facilities. Uh, councils, this council and other councils are directly responsible for the upgrade and upkeep uh, of those facilities, often in partnership with the sporting clubs themselves. Those sorts of things will all, all of a sudden be difficult for us to um, respond to. Uh, we may choose to uh, uh, respond to that uh, particular thing by uh, increasing our debt, which then has some long-term financial implications for this council. Um, and it's a, it's a problem that all councils will face in this regard. So um, I'm not in favour of it. I think it's, uh, it lacks um, a distinct um, understanding of how uh, councils go about doing their business. I think it's a focus on tax rather than uh, what we should be focusing on, and that is transparency and financial prudence. Thanks, Angela. I've got a question now from Craig in Heinlarsh via a webinar. When will the council become less focused on the seaside suburbs and spend rates more equitably across the whole city? Um, Earlier on, I think uh, Darren touched on the fact that we spend in the order of uh, $26 million per year on uh, renewal projects. Um, those renewal works include um, renewal of uh, our roads, our footpaths, uh, uh, lighting, uh, playgrounds, um, a whole raft of uh, stormwater assets, a whole raft of assets that we're responsible for, and um, they are fairly evenly distributed across the whole of the city uh, when you look at those programs. Uh, in roads alone, we're looking at spending $12 million on renewal and rehabilitation, and they have quite an even distribution across uh, the city. Um, when it comes to some of the major projects that we're looking at, the new and upgrade project, uh, looking at the new and upgrade projects, um, we have um, significant amount that will be going towards the Port Road drainage project over the next three years uh, in the order of $12 million. Uh, so that's through the Albert Park, Royal Park uh, area. 
Um, and uh, as we mentioned before, the St. Clary Law Recreation Centre, we're hoping to uh, kickstart um, in 17-18 financial year. So there's quite a bit that's happening across the whole of the city. Um, and uh, there's also a number of reserves that the Mayor mentioned earlier on, which um, are scheduled to commence in 16-17. Yes, one of them, Point Malcolm Reserve, is a significant one on the coast, uh, but we also have Albert Greenshields Reserve, which is in Ridleyton, uh, Orsman Reserve at um, West Lakes, and MJ McInerney Reserve will be starting to plan for, uh, which is in the West Croydon area. I, think. Mm. Yeah. Well, I should also add, Jan, that we are going to be opening uh, a new uh, community centre mm -hmm. in Brompton. Mm -hmm. um, that's currently being refurbished uh, and should be open. Uh, around about the June July period, so that'll be something real exciting for us. Yeah, um, and we've got a, a new community centre right in the heart of a, a very growing uh, residential population there at Jurassic Bowden. Um, and Council's also committed last year to building a new uh, library hub uh, in the, the Westlakes uh, area um, in the next two years, so about 2018-19. So there are other uh, social infrastructure projects, quite large scale, that uh, Council's committed to. Yeah. They're going to be uh, available for the community, community over the next couple of years. Great. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cut in a little here, panel, because we're actually reaching the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has asked the question tonight. Um, you know, I was taking notes and there was actually some unexpected themes that came through. Um, in my little notes, um, so rates was mentioned, Coast Park was raised, flooding in Port Road, St. Clair Rec Centre, um, arts projects in Bowdoin, the tree can canopy question was one that stood out for me, questions around the beaches and equity amongst the suburbs, which is excellent. I'm really surprised by the breadth of the questions that have come through and impressed actually. But my favourite question, I have to say, my favourite question of the night that came through from Awesome Dude was, are we going to make some cocktails with the limes and lemons, <laughs> which are on the table? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. some really important themes came through, not just jokey ones. Um, the important thing is that the community consultation is still open on the annual business plan, so it's not too late for people to submit their feedback online. Well, not just online, but also in person. So we have uh, the annual business plan, the draft annual business plan, and paper surveys available in all of Council's facilities. Um, so you can go there, complete a survey. We also have online surveys, we have discussion forums, and online Q&A available on yoursaycharlessturt.com.au. So that's yoursaycharlessturt, one word, .com.au. Okay, uh, if people would like to make a deputation at a council meeting, you can do so at the 9th of May, but you have to book that in, so go to council's website to do that. And uh, we're accepting feedback right up until the 10th of May, so you have a good couple of weeks to submit your feedback, everyone. Right, it's nearly time for our webinar to close. Uh, Angela, would you like to say a few closing remarks? Just that I um, am really delighted that um, the uh, participants in the webinar, not just the staff, but also those people from the community have taken the time to join us in this journey, um, which is, is new for us all. And I think at the end of the day, uh, your wrap up Valley has demonstrated that um, people are um, willing to participate with this, um, give some great feedback, ask some important questions. And I think that at the end of the day, this will be reflected in the decision that we make um, regarding the budget, which is important to us all. Thank you very much. Yeah, and of course, when the consultation closes, that information will go to council. So council ultimately will be um, will be receiving the finalised business plan and endorsing it um, right at the end of this financial year. Great. So thank you very much for those who tuned in. Um, the numbers have gone up and down. At the moment we've got 17 people, but at one point we were over the 20s, which I'm very impressed about because this is our first webinar and um, I'm amazed that and, and very excited that people were willing to participate. So thank you very much. I've got two tiny evaluation poll questions for you all, so bear with me, I'm going to launch them. 
So the first one, has this webinar increased your understanding of the draft annual business plan? Okay, results are coming in. Well, that's great news. 100% say yes, it has increased your understanding. That is fantastic. And the very last one, do you think we should use this consultation tool more often in the future? Results are coming in. Whoops, still some coming in. Okay, here we go. I'm going to close it. Right, I'm going to share the results. Okay, the majority of the audience would like to see this used more in the future. 25% um, not sure, 8% say no. Great. So thank you very much again for everyone who tuned in. Um, thank you very much, panel, for your efforts, and thank you very much for the team behind the scenes who are forwarding on the questions to our panel. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did as we did. Thank you very much everyone and good night from us. Good night. Good night. Good night.